what does this actually achieve? I guess like the narrative that opening I tried to say was by doing this, we will be able to continue developing AI for the betterment of humanity. That's why it's called open AI. And I think that's the fiction. Microsoft is an invested tens of billions. I mean, on paper, like what's been announced is they've invested over 12 billion in opening up. Microsoft's fate is tied to this company significantly. I suspect that this is not the end of the drama. I don't actually think that this resolution is going to be like, okay, great. Like everything is back to normal. This episode is sponsored by ISS, a leading global provider of video intelligence and data awareness solutions Founded in 1996 and headquartered in Woodbridge, New Jersey, ISS offers a robust portfolio of AI-powered, high-trust video analytics for streamlining security, safety, and business operations within a wide range of vertical markets. So what do you want to know about your environment? To learn more about ISS's video intelligence solutions, visit issvs.com. That's issvs.com. They support us, so let's support them. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. In this episode, I talked to Karen Howe, a fellow journalist who is now a contributing writer at The Atlantic. She was previously writing for the Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong, and before that for MIT Technology Review. She's the journalist with probably the best insight into OpenAI, and we talked about the events of the past week. Karen knows the players, knows OpenAI's history, and has some unique insights into what happened and what we're likely to see in the future. Beyond OpenAI, we talked about the likelihood of artificial general intelligence happening in the near future, as well as the existential risk that many AI researchers are concerned about. I hope you find the conversation as fascinating as I did. My name is Karen Howe. I am currently a contributing writer to The Atlantic um, and also writing a book about the AI industry through the lens of OpenAI's rise and impacts around the world. Um, I became a tech journalist very much by accident. I um, had studied engineering in college, and mm -hmm. then I worked in Silicon Valley at a startup. And in the first year of working there, I sort of saw um, very rapidly kind of like the ills of Silicon Valley, if you will. Um, I, the startup I was working for, uh, the CEO was fired. So actually very relevant to today, <laughs> this weekend's um, events, the CEO was fired by the board. And um, I became very disenchanted with uh, sort of the progression of events that, that followed around both leading up to and, and after the firing of the CEO. So I was looking for other opportunities um, and I wasn't really convinced that I would be able to find something different within the Valley. So I kind of, um, I had this vague inkling at the time that I would enjoy journalism um, in part because I'd always enjoyed writing and um, I was particularly interested at the time in climate change and how do you, how do you, uh, facilitate, how do you incentivize mass groups of people to change their minds and change their behaviors? Um, and originally I thought tech was the means to do that. Then I started thinking maybe actually journalism is the means to do that. Like you need to really build public opinion and public support for the science around something before people are going to act on it. Um, so I started working as an environmental reporter for my first job. Hmm. Um, but when I was looking for, it was an internship. And when I was looking for full-time opportunities, it was very difficult for me to get hired as an environmental reporter because I didn't really have that kind of background. But mm -hmm. um, consistently I was asked, would you be on our tech desk instead because of the background that I had? Um, and so I ended up becoming a tech reporter. And then I became an AI reporter also, not because I chose it, but because um, it was a job that was available and then it became sort of the perfect match for me because 
I was really, really fascinated um, by AI technologies. And um, I actually had a lot of friends from college that had gone into AI research sort of on the other side. Um, so I was like able to kind of quickly embed myself in the community. And I realized that it was this microcosm of exploring all of the narratives that we have about technology, the promise of it, the power, the potential, um, the societal impact, the sort of uh, moneyed interests that are involved, the egos that are involved. Um, and so I ended up reporting on that for now um, more than five years. Yeah. And you were at uh, MIT Tech Review, correct? I was at MIT Technology Review, and then I went to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then I joined contributing writer um, at The Atlantic. Um, and while I was at MIT Tech Review, I guess this gets to your other question of when did I embed in OpenAI. While I was at MIT Tech Review, our focus was really on um, trying to cover like the bleeding edge of AI research. Um, mm -hmm. So whereas, you know, the journal takes a very different stance, it's like we the journal covered technologies that are starting to be commercialized, that are starting to have um, some kind of business potential. MIT Tech Review was like, if it had business potential, it was already too late. <laughs> so it was always about how do we try to call the trends before they happen? Um, and because of that, we started covering OpenAI um, uh, very quickly after they were founded. They were founded in, at the end of 2015. And we probably started covering their research in 2017 because that's when they started producing some stuff that was um, starting to push the boundaries. Um, and then in 2019, I I can't really remember like how this came up, but I basically had a discussion with my editor at the time where I was like, I think OpenAI is sort of just a really interesting lab and there hasn't really been that much coverage of it. Like we've covered its research, but we haven't really covered its people. Um, and it, they were starting to become just prominent enough within the tech world that it felt like it was a worthwhile thing to do. And my editor at the time said, you should just profile them. Um, and so I reached out to the company. They already knew me pretty well because I had been covering their research. And I said, hey, you've never had a profile done before. I think I would be the best person to do it. I think MIT Tech Review would be the best publication. Um, mm -hmm. And let me come to the office for three days and sit in on some meetings, chat with researchers, chat with executives. Um, so that's what I did. I ended up flying to San Francisco from Boston. Um, and then I spent the three days there. Um, and this was at the end of 2019. So this was a really, really interesting period of time in the company's history because I went there a month after Microsoft invested a billion dollars mm -hmm. into the research lab. So in the, in that year of 2019, the GPT-2 announcement happened, which GPT-2 was, uh, as people may, listeners may remember, it was a few generations before ChatGPT and initially OpenAI took the stance of not releasing the model, but announcing to the world that they had developed it. Right. So that happened at the start of the year. And then it was a really big controversial decision um, because people thought, like, why would you announce it, but then not release it? That's really odd. Um, and then the capped profit arm was created um, within this nonprofit entity. Sam Altman joined as CEO and then the billion dollar investment happened. So it was a rapid succession of changes that were that made clear that the company uh, what, what was a nonprofit was quickly evolving into sort of a company and that it was sort of um, positioning itself to become bigger and bigger and more influential. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And that uh, GPT-2 debacle is how I regarded it, uh, was sort of the first glimpse uh, of what was to come because uh, they, uh, they, they said they developed it, but it was too dangerous to Your release age. and and it was so everyone of course that that got everybody excited like what the hell is this thing and then there were limited uh you know people were invited to to review it uh the the, the creation of uh, i mean in your article in the atlantic article the 
and and it's really what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, you have a line, uh, and I think it's it's what uh, a lot of people are are thinking and concerned about. Uh, that, uh, and I'm going to try and find it here if I can find where I opened it. I don't have it open, but you have a, a line about how you know this most important and powerful technology mankind has ever developed is controlled by half a dozen people uh, who, who, are, who are fighting among themselves. And that's kind of frightening. Uh, and, and, uh, and the whole uh, sort of fiction of the nonprofit with a, pro- a profit, even if it's a cap profit uh, subsidiary, uh, I, I wanted to ask if, uh, is that a fiction as well? I mean, it's all the same people. It's like you and I, have a nonprofit. Oh, and you and I also have a profit arm. Uh, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, we put on one hat and we're a nonprofit, we take it off and we're a profitable, a profit seeking company. So yeah. uh, is there any real, uh, is that just a fig leaf from your point of view? And, and what do you think about uh, th- this kind of technology being in the hands of such a few people and people who evidently can't necessarily agree. So I think the nonprofit for-profit arm, I mean, it's interesting. The people that designed that structure were Sam Altman, Greg Brockman, and Ilya Sutskever, who ended up becoming the main characters of The Weeknd. Um, I can't personally speak for what Sam believed when he designed this, uh, because I never spoke to him about it, but I spoke with Greg extensively about it during the time that I was embedded within the company. And he genuinely thought that this was the solution to kind of raise, they they were trying to solve a problem. They realized that um, AI development, the type of AI development that they wanted to pursue uh, would be very, very expensive. And, they needed to raise more money than a nonprofit could uh, help them raise. And um, they tried to, I remember Greg said this to me during that, that time that I was embedded there. there, He was like, we did actually try because um, like this notion of like having this nonprofit was very, very like near and dear to us. So we didn't want to just immediately go like, you know, let's, let's scrap it and move for a for profit. So this, like, at least for Brockman, he genuinely thought that this was like a really clever solution that they'd come up with to solve this problem of needing the money, but also staying a nonprofit. Um, but the thing is that it's like, what is, what does this actually achieve? I guess like the, maybe the fiction is that this, the narrative that opening, I tried to say was by doing this, we will be able to continue um, developing AI for the betterment of humanity and with the participation of humanity. Like this was a really big part of their early days um, messaging as well was like, they were going to be open. They were going to be transparent. That's why it's called open AI. Um, and the, I think that's the fiction, like the nonprofit for profit um, solving the specific problem that they wanted to. I think that is, you know, like they, they were genuinely trying to solve this like very particular problem, but does it actually get us more open, more transparent, um, participatory AI development? No, not at all. Like the the like what it actually does is just, just entrenches the power of the people that designed this thing. And ironically, I mean, what we saw this weekend was that um, the nonprofit for profit did end up working as designed, in that the board did in fact do what their job was to vote out uh, Sam for like not aligning with the mission supposedly. But then when the, like the reactions that we see from Sam, from Greg um, and ultimately from Ilya, when, when Ilya flipped suggests that they're not actually here for the, this mechanism to be used against them. Right. But that like, if, if that were, if the mechanism were designed with like true 
um, sincerity of, you know, like maybe one day I'd actually ask Greg, I'd ask like, would you ever consider firing yourself if you felt that you were no longer um, up for the job? Um, which I, c- I could have even phrased it as, would you be open to the board firing you or the board firing the CEO if if they evaluate? And at the time he said, like, I would be open to it. But clearly, like, they weren't actually open to it, right? <laughs> um, so that's the fiction that I think um, kind of was, was became very plainly displayed. Yeah, and and the the board is the board of the nonprofit. Is that right? The board, yes, the board is part of the nonprofit, and the nonprofit governs the capped profit, um, and that's why the board was able to exercise the power that had been bestowed upon them with this legal structure to vote out Sam. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see if that uh, nonprofit profit uh, structure survives uh, yeah. because it, it it doesn't uh, seem to make a lot of uh, sense. I mean, going back to GPT-2, that was the thing that upset a lot of people. Uh, open AI, open AI was supposed to be uh, kind of an answer to big tech, to Google specifically, exactly. Uh, and and that they are going to be open source. They're going to share all their research. It's not going to be controlled by a for profit entity. Uh, and and maybe that's that was just naive. That uh, when anyone develops anything that has such profit potential, whether or not the the um, the the logic is that they need to raise funds and investors need to have. Uh, some profit participation, otherwise they won't invest. I mean, ultimately, uh, this kind of uh, technology is not going to survive uh, in, under a nonprofit umbrella, uh, I think. But uh, but more specifically, uh, you know, I, I talk, and I'm, I know you do too, to Yen LeCun, who I have enormous respect for. Uh, and not, I mean, obviously... <laughs> He's, he's a you know genius, uh, but I, I mean in terms of his uh, his opinions on things like open source versus uh, proprietary uh, research. And uh, do you think that this kind of tech should be open source, regardless of the the dangers of open sourcing incredibly powerful technology, but simply to avoid this sort of thing? Uh, that that then you have uh, the broader research community uh, w- working on it, refining it, and uh, and then you know some sort of a license uh, structure that uh, allows people to to use it, whether it's for research or commercial use. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I um, to be honest, I haven't fully made up my mind about whether to fully open source technologies like these, but certainly we need more transparency than we need now. I think yeah. that is very, very clear. Um, and also what's interesting, I, I will say that Meta, I mean, Jan has been a big advocate of open source or, or of transparency, but Meta's Llama 2 model does not actually technically fit the definition of open source. Um, they mm-hmm. open sourced the model weights, but by definition, they would also need to open source the data in order for people to audit it, to understand um, how it works. And Meta has refused to release any information about the data that it was trained on. Um, and, And this is something that I think could easily become like a very, um, low, low stakes accountability measure is releasing the data, just saying like what, what's in the data, um, already is a huge step forward and you haven't trained the model, like that the data is not the model. So if you're worried, if, if we were to buy into the idea that open sourcing the model could have dangerous potential, open sourcing, or open sourcing the data would not, you know? Um, but the fact that we don't have any understanding whatsoever of what is being used to train these models, I think is a very telling um, sign of what, uh, why actually these companies that say that they can't open source the technologies, what is the true motivation behind their arguments? And and do you think that's because uh, they're afraid of liability? Uh, you know, Absolutely. the IP issue, yeah. 
Absolutely. I think they're afraid of uh, liability of reputation damage um, because a lot of the content that is put into these systems is not actually vetted very well. Um, And that's precisely why open sourcing would create safer systems, because if you force companies to open source, they would have to significantly do more work to clean up the data sets, which would actually result in better products. And if you have uh, many more scientists within the community, many more other people within the community going through like more eyes on these data sets, they will naturally just become better. And, and I think it would also be a forcing function to then get to a place where um, like some of the companies are now doing this, where they're striking data deals, where they actually purchase the data from a media company yep. or from Shutterstock or whatever it is. Um, that came very late in the stage of the AI development that we're in. Like all of the original models ha- did, were not developed with these data deals, right? And now like the companies kind of can continue to profit off of the data that wasn't paid for and that wasn't... Um, uh, they they weren't being transparent about. But if we had more of this transparency, it would be a forcing function to accelerate this trend, which I think is a really good one. Like there should be payments for data and potentially yeah. even um, dividend payments to, to yeah. the data providers, data creators um, over time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, an interesting idea that, you know, I know you know the same people I knew that Don Song, uh, at Berkeley has been working on this idea of, uh, of you know, using the blockchain to to secure your data and and then uh, be able to sell it and have kind of this lifelong uh, income stream coming from it, uh, which sounds great to me. Now that I'm close to retirement, it'd be nice to have a an income stream off the data that every company has ever. <laughs> used of mine um exactly. the uh, yeah the so uh, on a, where do you think i mean sam and greg are back at open ai uh Ilya is uh i feel bad for him he, you know i've interviewed him he's such a, a a deep soul you know uh he he clearly uh, didn't mean to cause this this uh global ruckus uh helen toner i feel bad for her she's been raked over the coals people have made fun of her research um where do you think this is going to go i i i can't imagine that i think there there what three people on the on the new board Mm -hmm. uh that again with this technology as as critical as it is, I would assume uh, at the very least Microsoft will have a seat on the board. Uh, where do you think it's it's going to go in in OpenAI's case? And then we can talk about uh, sort of government regulation. I would think that uh, that uh, regulators would be looking at this and saying, you know, we can't have a bunch of you know thirty somethings uh, in Silicon Valley like. Yeah. Yielding the future of the world. So, yeah. I think for OpenAI's case, I suspect that um, we're, it, this is not the end of the drama. I don't actually right. think that this resolution is going to be like, okay, great. Like everything is back to normal. Sam's installed, all's happy and peaceful and all, you know. Um, like the piece that I wrote in the Atlantic talks about how there's all these different factions with the company, different ideologies, they all are kind of in this power struggle. And I really do think that the more powerful a technology is, the more you end up with a Game of Thrones style power struggle, because people think very, believe very strongly in their ideology for how AI should be developed. And it's both like this belief that's like a true, genuine belief. And also, of course, like there is elements of desire for power, desire for control. Um, And we've seen OpenAI go through different waves of drama before. So this is just the third wave, You, I guess you could call it, like the Elon Musk leaving OpenAI was the first right. wave, and then the Anthropic OpenAI split was the second wave, and now this is the third wave. There's definitely something else that's going to come. Um, but in terms of like 
what this means, I guess, for the course of AI development, I I suspect that, I mean, Sam is um, certainly going to be a lot wiser about selecting carefully, choosing his board members and trying to make sure that he entrenches his power again. So if, if that is the case, then um, his specific ethos and his sort of habit around rapid commercialization, rapid growth is going to now be like the main driving seat of the organization. And um, that is going to continue. To, we're going to see like way more proliferation of products, um, way more st- downstream companies like building on top of it. And unfortunately, I think we will see way more um, uh, ripple effects, negative ripple effects as well as like a f- speed um Uh, overtakes, you know, um, uh, certain types of like trust and safety concerns, for example. Um, And so I, I think that uh, that's probably the most likely scenario, but also it's really hard to know. It's really hard to know because um, I don't know if you saw, there was like that, that, that letter that was circulating open letter to the board from former employees. Um, So it's like, is that going to be yet another episode in this particular weekend saga? Um, Or are we, is it buried for now and we don't see something else for another one to two years? Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got, uh, Microsoft and, uh, you know, Satya is, is publicly be all smiles and everything's fine, but you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, guys. he must have been sweating like crazy because yeah, yeah. Microsoft has invested tens of billions. I mean, on paper, like what's been announced is they've invested like something like uh, over $12 billion, um in opening up, but it's way more than that in the sense that um, when you look at their investor, like their latest investor statement, they they say that they're planning on laying down more than fifty billion dollars in new data centers for next year, and not all of that is for OpenAI, but they're laying that down because they're selling to Azure, their cloud compute customers, this right. idea of the Microsoft OpenAI partnership, and this is why Microsoft stock has been doing so well is. It, it 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 is bank it banks on this partnership so like you know when the when the news came and like the microsoft stock immediately started dropping and now that like things are back to normal microsoft stock is increasing microsoft's fate is tied to this company significantly significantly um so yeah it <laughs> poor yeah. satya must have been like <laughs> Yeah, although a brilliant move because at one point it looked, and this is well, all you know, all over uh, Twitter and commentators were saying, but that he, in effect, uh, had acquired OpenAI or was on the cusp of acquiring right. OpenAI without having any any regulatory interference or or even having to pay a premium, uh, actually yeah. paying a discount. So, uh, yeah, the uh, just on the data centers, this is something I'm. Uh, been talking to people about uh, th- uh, s- this technology is is so much promise for enterprise, uh, but because of the constraint in in available uh, compute, which which goes all the way back to uh, you know silicon starts at the foundry. Uh, but but then through to to Nvidia uh, and and their uh, limited uh, supply, uh, you can't actually build and deploy a heavy use enterprise application uh, using uh, GPT four through an API. Just the the pipe through which you're sending your tokens mm-hmm. uh, is too narrow. Uh, is is this investment by Microsoft intended to ease that? Uh, what do you think about that uh, that constraint? How long that'll last? Um, I definitely think that. Yeah, I I do think that Microsoft's investments are meant to try and um, facilitate kind of all of their customer base to transition to an AI forward business, I suppose. Um, because I mean, every 
every company that I've been talking to these days, regardless of what industry they're in, is suddenly alert to the idea that they need some kind of AI strategy. Um, and all of the tech giants, Microsoft, Google, um, uh, AWS, Amazon, are mm-hmm. all trying to capture that new market. And they're trying to build out their infrastructure to also facilitate that integration with these these um, business customers. And um, I mean, it's, I personally, I think there's sort of two interesting things that I'm I'm personally watching for. One is how much of this talk is going to actually convert into implementation, because a lot of the companies I talk to, they say they need the AI strategy, but they're actually not sure what that means and, and whether or not it would ultimately pan, um, be valuable for their business. You know, it is valuable right now for their business to talk about it, but will it actually be valuable later for right. them to implement it? Um, so that's one thing to look out for. And then, and then I guess the second thing is, um, whether or not these companies, these, uh, cloud providers that are kind of jockeying for market share are even able to acquire the resources necessary to continue laying down the data centers to keep up with this kind of demand. I think those are two things that could potentially end up, um, limiting AI adoption or, or, or like bottlenecking AI adoption, but, um, it's sort of difficult to tell right now, uh, what that will actually look like in, you know, in five years time, maybe. Yeah. Have you heard any, uh, anything that you haven't published or that you have published about, uh, this idea of, uh, uh, Sam Altman starting a chip company or open AI starting a chip company, uh, to compete with uh, NVIDIA? Um, only only what's reported. I mean, yeah, it, it, my my understanding is that this was this is not a new idea for him, that it was something that he had always been kind of interested in, but had never maybe maybe not taken seriously before. I'm not sure. Um, but that, you know, then it became much more real and viable potentially and potentially a a smart business decision to be able to actually have that. But the thing is like, um, I don't know that people fully understand sometimes that it doesn't matter how many chip companies we have. We only have one real chip manufacturer, which is TSMC. (laughs) Um, and you're not going to get, I mean, Sam's, uh, Samsung as well. Um, and like a couple, um, other companies that, that, that are able to sort of produce these chips, but, um, TSMC is sort of like the most consistent provider and everyone wants to use them. And no matter how many chip companies you have, there's still that bottleneck. So I'm not really sure what Sam's plan was with that. Um, like whether he was trying to create his own chip company to get around the waiting list for NVIDIA or whether he was doing it for something else, like maybe for optimizing, like trying to get to the next stage of AI development, maybe um, by trying to optimize um, how model training works by going to the hardware level. I'm, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that uh, when people talk about chip companies, they're not actually manufacturing this, the, yes, the silicone exactly. chips, they're designing uh, chips. Um, the, uh, you know, I love the, the, the bit in the article about uh, uh, Ilya chanting, feel the AGI. Uh, I'm a big AGI skeptic. Uh, I agree with Yen Lacoon again. I mean, I, I, uh, a lot of his ideas really resonate, uh, with me, uh, that, uh, that language models are not the way to AGI. I mean, they'll certainly advance to something. Um, do you, do you, do you, uh, you know, as a journalist, uh, but a very well-informed journalist, how, what's your feeling about that? Do you think, uh, uh, you know, I get, I get comments all the time, uh, you know, on various things that I post that, you know, AGI, we're going to, we're going to reach super intelligence sometime next year. And it's like, Really? Uh, so yeah, what, what's your, your sense of that? My feeling is that 
what de- we don't have any agreed definition of AGI. So AGI could be here if you define it the based on what we have, you know, or it could be like a hundred years away if you define it totally differently. Um, so for the people who are saying super intelligence might be here soon, I mean, we don't like even scientifically, we don't have a, a agreed upon definition of intelligence. But and I'm not I'm not talking about AI. I'm talking about like from yeah. biology and psychology and neuroscience. There's no agreed upon definition of intelligence. So yeah, I, I mean, like I'm sure that these people that are saying these things uh, totally agree with them. You know, it's sort of it's sort of just like you get to define yourself what the goal is and where to go. And I think this is the fundamental problem of of AI, the AI industry as a whole. And um, as illustrated this weekend of of OpenAI is that by setting a goal towards something that is completely undefined, you kind of just get to do whatever you want and say that it's under the banner of a thing that sounds really nice and magical even and, um, uh, and, and and like de facto good. But, um, but that, yeah, but ultimately like that's actually the AGI is just like, it's actually just sort of like a rhetorical tool to continue advancing towards whatever you want it, you want to advance towards. Yeah. Although I think we all have an idea of, of, I mean, people who are paying attention to the space of what it would look and, and uh, feel like, um, I mean, but, but, you know, I'm a, I really like Yan LeCun's world model research, uh, because it's grounded in, you know, in, in then language you, you layer on top of that. Um, the, the, uh, you know, Ilya is a student of Jeff Hinton's. Jeff is, uh, now beating the existential risk gong. <laughs> uh, what, what do you th- think about that? Because again, um, I'm, I'm, I lean more towards Yan and his view, uh, that it's, you know, certainly there are risks, uh, but but this existential risk is a bridge too far. So I've talked with Hinden about this, actually, um, like what actually uh, changed his mind about this thing, because it was he changed his mind um, yeah. sort of relatively recently. And it was specifically that he realized that the definition again this goes back to definitions the definition that he was using for superintelligence before was potentially the wrong benchmark and that he should actually just be observing the ability of these technologies that we have to engage with the real world and influence people and um and and, and cause like real world phenomenon and that um we had already reached a point where it was causing like mass real world phenomenon it it was like um and uh large scale influence you know and that whereas humans are very lossy in our ability to transfer knowledge that digital intelligence as he was calling it digital intelligence is not like you could have multiple models that immediately combine their knowledge i'm saying all this in quotes because i think it's sort of important to emphasize that um, that uh, there are lots of debates around like the use of these terminology, but um, that they, that digital models would be able to combine instantly, uh, transfer knowledge instantly, and then um, that is how you would reach super intelligence. I am extremely, you know, I'm extremely skeptical of these claims as well. I think that Hinton believes what he believes and has a very logical path for what he believes. I also think that ultimately, like who like to me it's sort of like you would have to have it it, we don't have very good techniques right now for developing um advanced capabilities without massive data centers so it doesn't to me it doesn't make sense that we should fear like a hundred models suddenly combining into one who's training those 100 models like Mm -hmm. these models are exorbitantly expensive dario mode ceo of anthropic said publicly on stage um, earlier this year that currently the industry is training models that are around a hundred million dollars um, of cost, then it's going to be a billion dollars of cost. And he could see in two years, it reaching $10 billion of cost. I mean, there's not like, 
are we going to train a hundred ten billion dollar models and then worry about them combining into super intelligence? I and like where are we getting the data from the uh, for this from? I I think it's um it immediately sort of hits the real world limitations, but. Uh, you know, like these scientists that have been working on these things for a long time, they have like a very, I think they sometimes have tunnel vision about the things that their, their research and um, they're not necessarily <laughs> spending a lot of time out in the world. <laughs> like they're, they're like in their lab and like thinking about these things from like a mathematical theoretical perspective. And if you were to think about it from that perspective, then certainly I think you would start to get to some alarming conclusions, but um, yeah, that's sort of my view on it. This episode is sponsored by ISS, a leading global provider of video intelligence and data awareness solutions Founded in 1996 and headquartered in Woodbridge, New Jersey, ISS offers a robust portfolio of AI-powered, high-trust video analytics for streamlining security, safety, and business operations within a wide range of vertical markets. So what do you want to know about your environment? To learn more about ISS's video intelligence solutions, visit issvs.com. That's issvs.com. They support us, so let's support them. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Karen for her time. If you want to learn more about what we talked about today, you can find a transcript on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. And in the meantime, remember, the singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world, so pay attention.